We're on a mission from God. Wendy? So I got that going. Darling? Looks like I picked the wrong week to quit sniffing blue. Light of my life. We enjoy your films. I am a human being. I thought they smelled bad. On the outside. Welcome to Vintage Video, where we're rewatching the 80s so you don't have to. We'll be reviewing every major film release of the 1980s in real time, overanalyzing what you've seen and spoiling what you haven't. I'm Patrick O'Reilly. I'm Jess Bayless. And I'm Richard Wells. And today marks the 40th anniversary of the release of Middle Age Crazy on July 25th, 1980. It was written by Carl Kleinschmidt, based on the song written by Sonny Throckmorton, and sung by Jerry Lee Lewis. I can't believe this was based on a song. Like how the, many, Yeah, how many movies are based on songs? Well, and the song came up. I'm like, oh, they wrote like a mediocre song to go along with this movie. And you're like, nope. No, it was a movie, great song. <laughs> this was a Such medi- a good song. This was a mediocre movie written for a stupid song. <laughs> uh, directed by John Trent, produced by Sid and Marty Croft, and released by 20th Century Fox somehow. There is no recorded production information for this film, aside from it having been a Canadian-American co-production and probably a tax dodge. I was, I was as soon as I saw that in the credits, yeah. I was like, "Oh yeah, this is this is another one of those tax movies." Yeah. it's definitely it's definitely a movie that you're just dumping money into because you need to get rid of it somewhere. You know, and, you wouldn't otherwise make this movie. And I guarantee you that everyone on set hated the movie, like actively while they were making it, they were like. This is dumb, but we have to do it because it's our job. Is that why uh, Bruce Stern feels annoyed the whole time? <laughs> <laughs> he feels annoyed in every movie. I've never seen him not feel annoyed. Do you know who I am? <laughs> uh, I have to say, like, also seeing Sid and Marty Croft's name in the opening, I was like, oh, maybe I don't know what this movie is going to be like. Maybe this is going to be some kind of zany, crazy weirdness. Yeah. Uh, and it was not. I feel like the only way they personally could have saved this movie as if the entire time bruce dern was just wearing a giant felt head of his own face <laughs> <laughs> but be like that, that frank movie <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> who was in there it was uh it was um magneto right it was fast bender yeah. yeah uh i mean i know we're gonna get into the movie here yeah but because i got i was very excited for the opening of this movie yes uh because of the cbs fox logo yeah um because it looks direct to video yeah uh, but um that that little fanfare is burned into my mind because star wars was originally released by cbs fox oh interesting on vhs yeah so every time you start up the star wars vhs you saw the cbs fox logo and you heard that little fanfare <laughs> and i hadn't heard it probably since the 80s and when this movie started and played that theme, I was like, oh, it like I had this rush of like nostalgia <laughs> into my body. And you I was throw like, that onto your phone as a ringtone. Or I something. know. I was like, oh my god, I haven't heard. I almost, I was almost in tears uh, <laughs> because it was just so exciting to hear. And, and then, then I you was the movie for the rest of the movie. Yeah, then I was also <laughs> <were> in tears. <laughs> <laughs> According to the opening credits here, this is our second consecutive Michael Caine movie. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this guy spells it wrong. Um, the sun is setting behind a bunch of, I think, oil pumps. Uh, a credit comes up that says that this features songs by Burt Bacharach, whose wife Angie Dickinson starred in our previous film, Dressed to Kill, released the same day. We follow city streets out to the suburbs and uh, over the backyard pool into the house of Bobby Lee and Sue Ann, not watching The Tonight Show because they're having sex in another room. His wife is shouting bingo as she orgasms. Bingo! Apparently she's keeping track, and they tied the all-time record at exactly midnight on his 40th birthday. That's not how bingo works. <laughs> no? <laughs> Should he be shouting letters and numbers at her while, <laughs> yeah, while this is I happening? Mean... <laughs> um, also, The Tonight Show in Texas did not run past midnight, so <laughs> that's a that's a mistake. Uh, she is very excited about his sexual prowess as an elderly 40-year-old. Uh, the next morning, Sue Ann reminds her son Greg not to be late for his father's 40th birthday. Later, a woman is riding on a lawnmower when Sue Ann pulls over to hitch a ride. Sue is surprised by how the mower feels, and the woman says, Damn near good as a vibrator! And twice as good as that son of a bitch Lamar! I don't think we see this woman again, though, for the whole rest of the movie. She gets brought up in conversation, but 
they just drop her here. She might have been at the birthday party, birthday party, but, but she it, doesn't say anything. If she yeah, does. she's not a major character for sure. But the two of them play tennis here and talk about what an important milestone turning 40 is, which this is the first I'm hearing. Then we cut to the parking lot of a Mexican restaurant called Senior Abe's, where Bobby is telling a coworker that they don't need any more clients right now, that Senior Abe's has enough work to keep them busy forever. The coworker rushes him off to a special occasion lunch, and Bobby correctly guesses that this means strip club. Bobby asks if they can move their conversation to the bathroom where they can at least hear each other talk. And uh, he complains there that his wife seems to be making sex into a contest and that he can barely keep up with her. The woman is screwing my brains out. He also hates that she seems obsessed with his turning 40. Back at their home during the party that night, everyone's watching birthday salutations on this weird curved flat screen television. Yeah, this is the weirdest monitor I've uh, ever seen. Yeah, so it's, um, I believe it's a front projection TV. Right. But it's it's bent forward at the audience. Th- that's how they work. Yeah. What, uh, what is a front projection TV? So from like a... The projector's behind the people watching it? No, no, no. It's um, So if you could picture the screen kind of looming like this, and just down on the floor in front of it are three giant lenses of color. You'd have the, the red... Uh, yellow and blue, and they or would red, blue, and green. Red, blue, and green. Yeah, probably yeah. Red, blue, and green. I know the I, my uh, my neighbor used to have one when I was a real kid, little kid. Uh, and they would have the signal split between those colors, and then they would the image would form on the screen. Huh. But it was never that clear. No, because it had to be perfectly calibrated because you have three separate lenses trying to project an overlaying image into the center. And it was curved like that to catch the light or something um, like what? The I don't one understand. that they have wasn't so much curved, but it was tilted way forward. It I was, think this one's just trying to look futuristic with the curved yeah. corners. Yeah, I was thinking very Jetsons in the oven. But yeah. the, but the quality was never anything like that, uh, and it, and and it was so faded and blurry because they didn't have it calibrated. At least this. These people didn't have it Now, at the time, would that have been desirable? I mean, obviously, the picture wasn't super clear. Was it desirable because you could get it larger than you could with, like, a cathode ray tube type television? Correct. They didn't make TVs anywhere near that size. The only way would be to project it. Got it. And, you know, like, uh, the TV that I had, that you guys had, that was originally mine way back in the day. Oh, the one that changed hands, like, four times? Yeah, that was a rear projection yeah. TV. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so similar concept. But the the size of the picture is limited by the size of the television. Correct. Whereas with a front projection television, presumably the higher you install the screen, the bigger the picture would be, right? Correct. Yeah, the further away it is, and then obviously because it needs to be bigger, it needs to be above people's like kind of eye level, I guess. Yeah. Uh, but on this screen, first we have Sue Ann uh, tearfully giving her 40th birthday message. Uh, And then she drags her son, Greg, into the shot. And then uh, Bobby's mother and father. His dad seems reluctant to record a greeting and tells him that 40's nothing, but 64 is the shits. 64 is the shits. I guess in 1980s terms, that was bad. (laughs) Because now I I would say, if somebody says, it's the shits, you think it's a good thing. Yeah, but I think when you pluralize shits, it's still bad. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, And this was being presented on a brand new Betamax player. Right. So we're getting the impression right away that these people are rich. I I just want to back up because of the big smile that Richard had when he said Betamax player. Betamax, (laughs) yeah. Well, I mean, because, you know, uh, some people probably, people who who are listening uh, may not know of the Betamax VHS. The war. The war. And and, and all wars. The wars that always end with whoever pornography chooses. (laughs) Exactly. Um, but, uh, yeah, Betamaxes were pretty great. Uh, although I guess porn lost, uh, in the Blu-ray versus HD DVD yeah. contest, but, uh, usually whichever format agrees to host pornography is the one that gets selected did, as the, <laughs> did Betamax infamously not do porn- pornography? VHS had porn and Betamax yeah, it, did not. It was just cheaper, cheaper equipment and, and cheaper in general. Uh, but you didn't have the quality and you didn't have the, the, the long play either. I don't think at the time. Yeah. Um, but also what's, did you guys notice what was in the background of these videos? No. It was like, was it a studio recording area or something? Yeah. It yeah. Ha- had a whole bunch yeah. of TV monitors. It was all HR puff and stuff and Sid Murray. Oh, so it was just stuff. their oh. offices probably. <laughs> That's, That's weird. 
The wife comes back on at the end of the video for a second time before dragging Greg's girlfriend Janet into frame. And she sort of says her message and that she she always thought he was a nice guy and that he's very successful and that he drives a shitty car. And so he must be great because no one would drive a shitty car if they had money. In the backyard, the filmmakers wasted part of the budget on the birthday song, apparently. The party devolves into a Congo line and downstairs in the basement, dad is giving Bobby his family watch and cries about his son turning 40. This was the only part of the movie that generated any kind of emotion from me. Him, his father, like holding him, almost trying to like like he's trying to hold his child. Yeah. Um. It it really choked me up. Um. And like I know that this movie, we're gonna we're gonna probably crap on this movie a little bit. Yeah. But this movie actually that part, this one part was like, oh my goodness, this is actually a really heartfelt moment for me. Yeah. I just thought it was weird because just a second ago he said forty isn't an important like milestone in a, in a person's life and then he immediately is like crying over his son's shoulder for this but um bobby asks you know it might be more related to his son's uh graduation here because his son is also hitting the milestone of graduating high school yeah either way bobby asks a party guest if she's having fun or needs a drink and she says no because it's against jesus's wishes Luckily for Bobby, he's dragged away just by some random party goer. But unluckily for JD, this woman's husband, she turns her condemnation on him. And he sheds some light on their relationship by warning her, if you start crying again, I'm not taking you home at all. <laughs> like he's just going to leave her because she constantly starts crying about things. And JD is uh, the his, co-worker. his business partner. Yes. Mm-hmm. Bobby spends a three second shot telling another party guest that his breath stinks. You ever heard of Banaka? And then we just cut immediately back to JD, now in the hot tub, halfway through a bottle of whiskey. And it's like, how did you do that so quickly? You were just arguing with your wife five seconds ago. There's a couple of really weird edits like that. Yeah. Um, And then we cut back to his wife standing in the same place where she was just yelling at him, begging for the Lord's forgiveness. Bobby heads into the garage looking for Greg and finds him having sex with his girlfriend in a parked car with the music blasting. As he heads back to the party, we keep cutting back to the fantasy version of what we saw in the car as Bobby's, like, imagining it. But the edit is really disorienting, and it's unclear until Bobby enters the fantasy what we're even seeing. Back outside, Bobby is embarrassed by his own fantasy of sleeping with his son's girlfriend when his mom asks him to speak to his father about his depression. For whatever reason, at 64, he's obsessed with his mortality, and he's making lists of all of his dead friends. And then not just dead friends but even just dead people yeah just people who he's heard of who have died and bobby agrees to have a conversation with him as she leaves she asks if bobby has seen a doctor lately to remind him of his own mortality and then the fantasy turns to a scene about bobby having died of a heart attack while having sex with his son's girlfriend and we cut to his funeral where he's giving a eulogy for himself and there's a pretty seamless yeah a uh, composite shot or it, camera tilt yeah it's it's a weird like as the as the camera pans up from the coffin to the lid it's like a weird little bit of a blur yeah but then it comes right back up to to bruce dern because it's an open casket and we see bruce dern lying in it and then as we tilt up to bruce dern giving the eulogy you know he's in two places at once in the one shot but mm. it's almost seamless the church is empty except for that curved flat screen where family members are randomly appearing as he mentions them. Can you um, really call it a curved flat screen? Yes. I mean, it's not flat if it's curved. <laughs> it's curved on, on one dimension, and it's flat on another dimension. The corners are curved. Oh, I think the whole thing. Like, yeah, I think I, it's I, like, uh, oh, it's, it concave? it's concave, like, oh, it's like, it? like a lens. Well, because when, when you have light projecting up at an angle like that, it, com- it doesn't come up as a perfect square. It comes up as like a, a trapezoid. Oh, okay. Um, and and so, the, so I think it's the curved curve, to compensate? I believe so. Well, that would make more sense. But when it's his dad's turn to talk, he offers some poignant advice. He says, Humping your son's girlfriend, that's the shit. After the party, everyone has gone home, and Bobby heads into the house for a very sudden epilepsy-inducing <laughs> strip dance. <laughs> that, that was my note. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was like, Sue Ann surprises him with a seizure. <laughs> yeah. It's not even footage. It's... Because she's moving weirdly faster than a person would. Right. It's literally just a bunch of photographs that they cut on and off, on mm-hmm. and off. But we cut to them already having had sex in a bed with like 20 light switches and two phones installed <laughs> on the headboard. I 
I don't know what that is about. It's unless, the future. Unless they're just having sex and sit in Marty Croft's office. Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, I mean, do they control every light in the house from this position? I don't know. And and I would be freaked out if in the middle of the night the phone rang and it was right above my yeah. head. It's very weird. He asks if they can spend some time away from the house, but together. And she's not really listening because she has a lot planned for his birthday week. And this is before you even had birthday weeks. Yeah. It was just supposed to be one day. And when you're 40, you don't even celebrate it anymore. Do you have birthday weeks now? People do. People on social media are like, oh, it's my birthday month. And they plan out things for the whole event. Bobby drives in the rain the next day with the voices of everyone giving him shit for turning 40 ringing in his head. Till he notices a Porsche on his right inviting him to race not only does he not race the porsche when the light changes but he just sits there until honking commuters wake him from his days he heads directly to the porsche dealership i'm gonna flip back and forth between porsche and porsche just like he does in this movie we cut immediately to him driving the porsche home and he speeds past other cars on the road flips off a cop switches lanes in front of an 18 wheeler before we flash back to the dealership where he's just we we see he's just imagining the scene again he locks eyes with a woman in the showroom, and the score lets us know that he finds her attractive. He also cannot stop staring at her, and it's just creepy. Now she joins the fantasy as he's driving down the freeway, and she's just, like, sleeping on his chest while he drives. The salesperson tells him that the Porsche 928 that he's looking at is listed at 40, and his voice goes up a couple octaves. Thousand? At a bar later, he asks JD to come back to the dealership with him to check out the car. JD says, Oh, you just want to see that cute girl again. I'm not sure why she would be back at the dealership, like, every time you go there. Yeah. She doesn't come with the place. Well, unless... She just hangs out waiting for people to buy a car? Well, yeah, she's like a plant for the dealership to get to lure people in. Like, oh, she, pretend, she pretends that she's looking at a car, and they go, this is the kind of woman who's interested in this car. You should buy this car. That yeah. is a car salesman tactic. <laughs> yeah. He brings up some project he's interested in pursuing that Bobby describes as a whorehouse that he doesn't want to build. Is this the same as the, this the, is, this the is suite the, that they're trying yeah, to build at the, the stadium? Yeah, this is the stadium remodel. Oh, I thought it was one of his taco stands. No, that's the thing that they are doing. <laughs> yeah, I got, got me. <laughs> oh, okay. I missed that. I missed that joke. I'm sorry. But yeah, he, he's not he's not interested in uh, in working on this uh, thing at the, at the Cowboys Stadium because he thinks that it's just a waste of their time and they should just keep making senior Abe's. Uh, his coworker says, we got to think about the future, though. Not if it means doing that. If that's what it means, fuck the future. At his son's graduation, Bobby gets tired of listening and fantasizes that he's addressing the crowd. He tells all the kids that life sucks and that if they think the future is bright, that they should look at their shitty parents and see that that's their future. And he finishes his speech with, The future sucks! and gets a standing ovation. Very deep writing. At Bobby's dad's house, we see him catching the tail end of a news story about police apprehending a crowd of Mexican-Americans at some kind of demonstration, and he turns off the TV in frustration and loudly suggests, They should have dropped the A-bomb on Juarez. Because he's just a shitty racist person <laughs> for no reason. Like, the whole rest of the movie has been like, oh, this is just like a sweet old man. Oh, but he also just fucking hates Mexicans with a passion. Yeah. I mean, it comes back later, but to it's, no end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Bobby's mother is reading in the paper that it's all over for Farrah Fawcett Majors, and Dad assumes that she died, but Mom just meant that her posters aren't selling like they used to. This was a big thing in the 80s, but all the A-list actresses would have branded posters. I remember when we interviewed Christina Wayborn for our MacGyver podcast, she talked about a poster she did with a tiger. Mm. that um she talked about how great it sold and how it outsold so-and-so's posters right. and like it was a thing people kept track of at the time but it's kind of doesn't exist anymore uh, or maybe it does i don't know i don't think people buy posters for their childhood rooms anymore apparently greg is at a grad night type celebration and this leads to a conversation about bobby's grad night and his long lost high school sweetheart linda McAllister. Bobby smiles wistfully as they discuss all of Linda's stellar extracurriculars, and then Sue Ann rips on her for either being a whore or a virgin. I can't really tell from what she says. She says, Linda McAllister, student council, glee club, pep squad. Only thing they forgot was virgin. Are you saying they forgot to list that among her accomplishments, or that was not one of her accomplishments? I don't know. But Bobby goes into a fantasy about meeting Linda under a gazebo in a park, 
and they spin around holding hands with each other, though they must be on some spinning platform because it doesn't look like their feet are moving. And while they spin, they speak entirely in voiceover, but their facial expressions match the words to give the impression they're speaking telepathically. Mm. I'm guessing that the dialogue here was actually an afterthought and it was just supposed to be a fantasy thing with music playing. I have no memory of this scene. (laughs) I just have to say that. (laughs) I'm like, when was this? (laughs) Uh, Wanda Jean, the religious woman from the party, JD's wife, is in the kitchen cooking with Bobby and tells him about an actual encounter she had with Jesus who appeared to her and told her that fornication is no longer necessary. Uh, We cut to a Winnebago honking outside and it sounds like Bobby's dad made an impulse buy of this RV and mom is pretty upset about it. Greg and Grandpa have a conversation about the journeys they're starting, Greg's trip to college and Grandpa taking his life on the road for a bit. Greg admits to Grandpa that he's studying to be an architect, but might not want to do that at all. Grandpa makes a bizarre proposal that if Greg promises to go to college, which he doesn't want to do, that he will promise to take Grandma on the road, which he doesn't want to do. (laughs) I don't know why either of them is agreeing to this. (laughs) Greg, for whatever reason, agrees, but soon after, as he's getting in the car to leave, admits point blank to his father that he doesn't want to go to college, and Bobby thinks he just doesn't want to leave his girlfriend behind, so he's not listening to this conversation at all. But wait, also with that deal, why is it beneficial to Greg for any reason to have his grandma go on the road? For no reason. The same as it's not beneficial to grandpa for the kid to go to college. Well, I could see that it'd be beneficial to him in that he wants his granted to be successful and he thinks that this is the way to success yeah well maybe taking grandma on the road is is the path to success after he leaves bobby's watching a football game when his wife comes in and says he better not be watching football just for the cheerleaders even though they're not on screen right now like how hard would it have been for them to just be on screen when she makes this comment he laughs her off and then she straddles him on the couch later he complains again to his coworker that this led to sex on a pool table And J.D. says, Wanda Jean won't even play pool on a pool table. Neither will Sue Ann. Suddenly, Bobby invites J.D. up to Dallas to take a look at that stadium remodel that he's been against this whole time. And so I was very confused because at first I thought this was a different character. Because J.D. follows up and says, we don't do remodels. And his line read wasn't in the way of like, Like, I thought you said we don't do remodels. It was like... We don't do remodels. Yeah, he's like, like, what are you talking about? I would never yeah, consider doing that, job. I was like, is this the same person? That was pitching that yesterday? Yeah. He says, well, I'm not talking about doing it. I just thought we'd go up and have a look at it. I just want to get away for a while. Uh, Sue Ann asks why they can't just send JD, and he says, it's business. And he tells her that he can't just keep building taco stands forever. Up in Dallas, JD and Bobby meet with Senior Abe himself in a luxury box, He's telling them all the improvements he'd like to see, including a radar range over the bar, which is the second shout-out for radar range microwaves after Airplane earlier this year. Senior Abe directs their attention out the window to the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders on the field and refers to them as real first-class pussy. It's real fun that the Dallas Cowboys organization gave their approval for this script. Yep. Because uh, that's ridiculous. And something else that's going to come up over the course of this movie is like, why would you... Be okay with that being out there in a movie. Bobby is trapped in another one-way staring contest as the cheerleaders exit the stadium that night. In his hotel room, he practices hitting on the cheerleaders in his mirror. At home again, he has sex with his wife in the pool, and she's shouting bingo over and over again when the phone rings. And it's Mama, and Bobby's father has passed away. They make all the funeral arrangements, and Bobby heads to the airport to pick up his absentee sister, who hasn't seen Daddy in 10 years. In the funeral procession, they have to pause for a moment to let some cars pass, and Bobby's mother is upset when she sees why they've stopped. Oh my God, Mexicans. Wouldn't Tommy just die? Oh yeah, I forgot. We we should mention again that he's a racist piece of shit. We shouldn't forget that. (laughs) Uh, Later we see Bobby on the phone at home, and he carries the phone into a room where his wife is watching Let's Make a Deal on full blast for some reason and tells her to turn it down instead of going back to the room that he was in with his wealth of phone cord. Yeah, and also you have a phone in the bedroom. Yeah, there's <laughs> phones all over this house. Uh, he seems to be panicking about a late delivery. Sue Ann doesn't care about the business because she wants to know how soon they can kick out his widowed mother and get back to the constant sex. Greg wants to talk about dropping out of school and Bobby agrees to discuss it next weekend. I don't understand the mom's perspective here at all. I mean, the his wife's perspective. Yes, yeah. She's because, very badly written. Yeah. 
in addition to that, it's just the timeline here, correct me if I'm wrong, seems very close together. I mean, yes. the kid was just talking with his grandpa about dropping out of school, and then the grandpa died, and now he wants the mom out. And we haven't resolved the kid dropping out of school thing. So this has been, I mean, at most, like a week or two, right? It's less than a week. It's crazy. Why yeah. Why was she so eager to kick out somebody who's mourning? Because like, she wants to have mother. sex every day and break a record every day. It's just weird. Yeah. Bobby's mother isn't sure that she wants to go with Bobby to take Becky to the airport. I don't know why we need to hear about that. It's yeah. completely irrelevant. It's pretty clear at this point that Becky was just added to try and clutter up his life more and make his plate seem fuller, but he really has no responsibilities to any of these people. His mom's problem doesn't even really matter, so he's just dealing with a kid that doesn't want to drop out and his selfish nymphomaniac wife. In another fantasy, Bobby's father appears as a judge, sentencing him to be everyone's dad forever. He's terrified because so far the extent of his fathering has been, we'll talk about it later for every problem that comes up ever. Including to his actual son, of which he is the father of. Yes. Uh, he comes out of the fantasy as he drops Becky off at the airport and tells her cryptically, I don't want to be the daddy. Because he's a child, I guess. He runs away and yanks off his jacket and buys a Porsche to the tune of Jerry Lee Lewis's awful song that was adapted needlessly into this film. He's middle-aged crazy Trying to prove he still can He gets a cowboy shirt, a big gold belt buckle, and some mom jeans. And at home, <laughs> Sue Ann blows up at him for buying a car he can clearly afford with the money he makes from the company he owns. Well, yeah, and he's not even paying for it. The company's paying for it. Yeah. Which, uh, and, he, and he said the IRS are, is writing an office. Like, is that? That's great. Uh, is that how it works? Well, if he uses it for work, sure. It's his car. It's his work vehicle. And, uh, and she's also very mad that he's letting his mom stay with them while she recovers from the death of her husband, Bobby's father, less than a week ago. Because she does say something like, I'm very upset. You know, it's it's been a very hard week. And he's like, well, it's it's been a hard week for her too. Like referencing the funeral. And it's like, yeah, that literally happened this week. And you're already like, get her the hell out of my house. If the message being conveyed here isn't, look what an awful caricature of a woman we wrote, or this couple doesn't belong together, then I'm not sure what it is. He apologizes to her for not just sitting there and getting yelled at. I cannot stand the editing of this movie. We have a couple second long shot of the conversation with Greg about quitting school that essentially begins and ends with Sue Ann saying, Bobby, huh? for God's sakes, Bobby, you tell him you're his father. Without any progress being made in the conversation to another fantasy of Bobby driving with, I think the, the same woman from the dealership. Correct. Then suddenly we're in an empty condo, presumably trying to kick grandma out. The realtor comes in and says, oh, they're asking this much, but I think we should, we should offer this much. Yeah, I was kind of shocked at this, though, because the price of the condo was like $52,000, yeah. and the price of the Porsche was $40,000. Right, but this is also Houston. I guess. I'm just saying, you're buying a car that's the same price as like the house you're, you're putting your mother in. Yeah, but it's also so quickly putting like a big bow on the, the whole story of, oh, well, right. my mom needs a place to live, and it's like, yeah, okay, like, well, we found a place, and it's real cheap, and mom doesn't care about moving out, so yeah. that's not an issue. So, to, for anyone. So now you only had two problems on your whole plate. And yeah. you just solved one of them in like two seconds. Yeah. And then immediately the fantasy music is kicking up again. And I pause the movie and walk away from it for a day. <laughs> uh, this is intolerable. <laughs> Don't bother it, watching it if you haven't already. I can vouch for the fact that... Because you were watching it before I started into yeah. it. And you were just infuriated like every time it's like up and down dun, the living dun, room dun, dun, dun. it's like suddenly it's a foggy <laughs> shot again and it's another fantasy it's like i don't care about this guy's fantasies this guy's an asshole he wakes from this fantasy to his wife shouting for his attention and when she finally gets it she asks what he wanted to tell her but he obviously wasn't about to say anything to her because he was in fantasy land he tells her that he has to head back to dallas soon and she leaves exasperated later we do this other thing where Instead of having a conversation between two characters, every line of dialogue is broken up by a scene change mm -hmm. for no reason. So even though this would be the next thing that she logically says, we cut outside to where they're just sitting on the patio across the table from each other, and he's trying to watch a football game or something. And she says, oh, well, this is all my fault, isn't it? 
why, why do you have to go now of all times? As if there was anything else happening in the movie for this to interfere right. with. She confides in Bobby before he leaves that she thinks Janet is pregnant and that that's why Greg doesn't want to leave. We've seen no evidence for this beyond the fact that they had sex at the birthday party, mm-hmm. which was like two weeks ago or maybe less than that. But who knows? Maybe it's true. It comes off as her just making something up so that he won't leave town. I the, It goes by so fast. I didn't even know that it happened until later on when Bruce Storm brings it up in another speech. Yeah. I was like, wait, when when, when did that happen? Yeah. And I went back. I was like, is this it? Is this the only mention of it? Yeah. And Sue Ann ends this conversation with, but See, that's what I mean. You just can't go to Dallas now. And we cut to him already driving to Dallas. Um, he's working late at the stadium when he finds a few cheerleaders drooling over his Porsche. One in particular, Nancy, is very impressed by it. She realizes after a moment that she actually saw him at the dealership in Houston, and it's the girl that he can't stop staring at. When she learns that he's a contractor for Senior Abe's, she brings up that alongside her cheerleading, she is also an interior decorator. And he says, Aren't you a cheerleader? What, a full-time cowgirl? On $15 a game? Which is another thing that Dallas should never have said, yeah, that's cool. Just put that in the movie. Yep. We don't care if people know that we only pay our cheerleaders $15 a game. And not for training or rehearsals or, or anything. anything else. We yeah. just give them $15. Yep. It's bucks literally $15 game, a week. Which is totally what they do. Yeah, I'm it's sure it is. It's just outrageous. But it's, it's just like... It's not even different now. It's crazy that they gave their approval for that, though. It's like, okay, you have two options. You have to say, oh, yeah, that's kind of a shitty thing we're doing. Don't put it in your movie. Or... We should pay them a lot more if you're going to mention how much they get paid in the movie. Yeah. But, yeah. So that blew me away. He's hypnotized by her name, though, Nancy. Sue Ann calls him that night to announce that Janet is pregnant and demands that he come home at once as though he has any say in what they might do. Although I guess maybe 1980 you did. You could just go to your son and say, I'm driving all of us to the abortion clinic and we're going to take care of this right now. Is the that next- what? Th- I don't think it's clear what they actually want him to do. Yeah. They never really take a stand on it. I got the impression at least that Sue Ann doesn't want her son to be a father already. Maybe. She doesn't say it overtly. Yeah. Uh, The next day he brags to JD that he has a date with a cheerleader, but he insists that it's just about business. When it turns out that Nancy also thought it was a business meeting, Bobby quickly explains that, no, I don't care about your professional work. And she is ecstatic to learn that this old man just wanted to have sex and not pay her any money for a job. Uh, we just cut right to them after having had sex. And now we officially don't care about anyone in the movie. There's no one left to sympathize with. And uh, she sees that he wants to leave and she's totally cool with that and doesn't care that he's married because she was just using him for his sexy body because married guys <laughs> don't get clingy. Back at their hotel, JD is fielding a call from their boss on this job. And Bobby apparently just skipped a meeting, though we never saw that meeting being scheduled well, or skipped. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's why he was checking his watch, because he was supposed to meet Senior Abe at a certain time. And, he... and JD said so before he went out. He's like, don't forget about the three o'clock meeting. Oh, OK. Yeah. I missed that part. But I, I thought that he did leave after that because she said, oh, you keep checking your watch. And then we don't see much more of that scene. So I assumed he just left. After yeah, that, I thought I guess he, he didn't. Yeah, I thought he left, too. But. I guess he stayed behind. Why? I don't know. Yeah, because she said, get out of my house, essentially. It's supposed to be no strings attached. You can go to your business meeting. Yeah. Ann calls their room just after Bobby gets back and is very upset that he's still doing this job in Dallas and hasn't just quit and raced home to have more sex with her. Bobby drives home, speaking in voiceover about how he's headed home to his wife to straighten out his life, and then suddenly he pulls a U-turn and drives back to the cheerleader for another date. After the date with the cheerleader, Senior Abe chews Bobby out until he just quits the job and drives away. Uh, He tells Senior Abe to take your everything and shove it straight up your conglomerate. And then he drives away and quits his job, the job that he's been doing his whole life, presumably. Well, the only source of income for his company. So his company is... Yeah, he's bankrupting his own construction company who does nothing but senior abe restaurants yeah i don't really understand the thought process here i mean i guess they actually have to represent that he's middle-aged crazy somehow by being crazy but i don't but it's just so illogical for this character we're supposed to sympathize with this guy and senior abe is a thousand percent in the right here it's like hey i'm paying you a lot of money to do a thing and you've been mia for two days 
And he's kind of giving him an out and he's not yeah. taking it. Yeah. And he's like, you know what? I quit this stupid job then. See ya, loser. Uh, when he gets home, Sue Ann is waiting on the couch, drunk, medicated, and smoking, which I guess she had quit because he's surprised to see that. She starts to tell him how while he was gone, she basically went out drinking with that friend from the lawnmower and got a DUI. And he interrupts the story to see if she has a point. Like, what are you talking yeah. about? She just told you she got pulled over by the police drunk driving. And he's like, is this story going anywhere, sweetie? I got a lot of literally nothing else to do mm -hmm. in my whole life. And she says, well, actually, you know what? It does have a point because after I got pulled over, I slept with one of those cops. And before she can even finish this sentence, he attacks her. He yes. smacks that drink out of her hand and winds up to hit her. Yeah, and he jumps on top of her on the couch. I yelled when this happened. Yeah. I was shocked because it's so it's so out of character for him. It just makes yeah. me so mad. They are not being consistent with who this guy is. He yeah, this guy should feel super guilty about having had sex with a cheerleader for the last 48 hours. And then coming home and finding out that his wife did it once with someone else and he just attacks her. Like, it's completely insane. But then they apologize back and forth for a while. And then we do this thing where what he would have said next, we're cutting to a few hours later there in the kitchen and he starts to admit what he did. He doesn't even finish admitting it. He says, you know, sweetie, there's something else I should tell you. And then we cut immediately again to several hours further into the day and they're in the backyard coming inside from presumably having been outside for a while and and she says do you love her so he he admitted to everything that he did but for some reason we don't get to see him admit it we don't get to see her reaction to it at all mm -hmm. i don't and, even think we get an answer to that question yeah this movie is like the seinfeld yada 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 episode where we're just editing around every scene that might carry any weight at all but she doesn't believe that he doesn't love her because they had sex more than once and more than once means that you're you're in love with the person. We cut again for no reason to sometime later in the house when he's still making the case that it has nothing to do with love. And he complains to her that everyone wants him to be the daddy. And the plot has not backed this up at all. Nobody's asking him for anything except for his wife. And all she's asking is for him to be around. And I wish he would stop using the word daddy because it makes him sound like a five-year-old. It's creepy too. I guess it would make him sound like an even bigger whiner to be like, people want me to be a father. But saying daddy makes it sound really creepy and weird because he's 40. The man child and the sex addict come to terms <laughs> with the dumb people they married. And eventually <laughs> Sue Ann asks him to leave. And he says, not until I, and she says, get the fuck out! He goes back to fuck the cheerleader again because he's stupid. And <laughs> she's entertaining another man. There's no reason this shouldn't have been Senior Abe. I wish yeah. it was. But it's just or another JD. or JD. Yeah, that I thought been great. I thought it would be funny if it was JD, but I was like, no, that messes up that character too. But then that's that's probably it's amazing that it wasn't JD because they well, could have fucked up every character. I think, but I think it actually makes a lot more sense because JD is obviously sexually frustrated, and he knows that there is this promiscuous cheerleader around who will have sex with anyone who likes married yeah. men specifically. That's true. Um, but I, I I wanted it to be senior I even be like. I was like, oh, you come to beg for your job back? And he's like, oh, shit. Like, you had, yeah, sorry, I didn't know you had a guest. In keeping with his history of not listening to anyone, he ignored the cheerleader when she point blank said that married guys mean no strings, and he thought that they were in a deep and meaningful relationship. He calls Sue Ann and basically says, hey, I went to fuck that cheerleader again, but her vagina's full. What are you doing tonight? <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> and understandably, she says, I won't be home when you get back. Uh, if these people end up together at the end of this movie, it's the saddest one of the year so far. I guarantee this screenwriter was divorced at least four times. Bobby somehow guesses correctly that his son would be moping around grandpa's headstone at the cemetery. Yeah. Uh, it's like, this guy never listens to anything his son says, but he's picked up enough that he knows to go to the cemetery to find him. It's like, why? Why does he know that? Yeah, it's There's literally week. no clues to that. There's obviously not a pattern emerging here that he does this all the time. Yeah. And, and then comes one of the most frustrating parts. I got so mad. I was like, it's like, well, if you're the kid, I guess I have to be the father. It's like, yeah. what? You were already the father. Yeah. Who raises this child? Yeah. Uh, Greg says that he used to talk with grandpa and that grandpa would actually listen. Bobby suggests that maybe now that he's 40 
and his son is expecting a child, maybe it's time for him to act like a father figure to someone. Makes me the daddy now, huh? He tells Greg he knows that there's a lot of pressure that he's going through right now because he's regretted his marriage and son for nearly 20 years. Greg will be a father before his dad is, and I hate this character. Their last chance at saving this film officially expired when they cut away from this cemetery without any zombie hands bursting through to the surface. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Bobby watches the birthday video of just his immediate family wishing him a happy birthday again. No video was necessary because they were all at the party in the room when they were watching it, and there was only five of them. But now it serves the purpose of being rewatchable after he's burned his life to the ground. Yeah, it, it would have been more meaningful if she kept trying to convince him to watch it yeah and then finally he watches it and it's just about how much she loves him and, yeah and he realizes he would realize something that's yeah. actually that would have been great we've heard voices from early scenes echo in his head for half of this movie already and i would argue that this video is still largely unnecessary he gets in the hot tub fully dressed apparently by accident we learn later i didn't realize it was by accident uh and he just starts drinking or i guess continues drinking and sue ann sees this as a sign of his budding maturity and takes the opportunity to forgive and apologize to him. He says he doesn't know if he's a granddad, he is, or if he's still in business, he's not. But he loves her a lot, so he deserves her back. Well, and she okay, <laughs> hold on, hold up, bag it up. When he says, I don't know if I'm a granddad, like, to me, that is, I don't, like, it's a casual comment to say, I don't know if my son's girlfriend got an abortion or not. Yeah. Like, that's horrible. Well, it, it also could just mean, like, how he wasn't sure until yesterday that he was even a father. Like, maybe he's okay, like... Okay, so it's super clear that she's pregnant. I just don't know if I take responsibility yeah. for anything I don't know if I'm life. technically the granddad. <laughs> I'll decide uh, when I'm fucking dead, I guess. 40 years from now, I'll decide whether I'm a grandfather. Where do you hit 50? Yeah. She's overjoyed at just being wanted because that is all that female characters ever need. And uh, he pulls her into the hot tub and agrees to sell the Porsche. We zoom out and pan over the house to the Porsche in the front yard and zoom into the hood, which looks damaged or just graffitied. Uh, yeah, someone wrote something on it, but I, I couldn't. Yeah. The quality wasn't enough. This was a, basically a VHS transfer, so I have no idea what the message on the hood says. I don't know who would have even written anything on this car. Like, the cheerleader wouldn't have written it. It looks like it's written. It looks like it, there's a heart. Right. With an arrow through it and a message written on the heart. But... Sue Ann wouldn't have written that before she went in to talk to him. And he wouldn't have done that himself. The cheerleader definitely would have done it because yeah. no strings attached. Maybe it's just like Janet's phone number. Maybe it's his son's girlfriend. It's like, hey, we took care of it. Come on over. Uh, neither of them agrees to go to therapy and they divorce later the same year. That part's not in the movie, but it's pretty obvious. Uh, the director here was John Trent. He wrote and directed Sunday in the Country and Find the Lady, neither of which anyone has heard of. Writer Carl Kleinschmidt has lots of TV stuff. This is his only feature, thank God. <laughs> Sid and Marty Croft are sibling entertainment producers, famous for fantasy programs led by large-headed puppets like H.R. Puffin stuff, Sigmund and the Sea Monster, Land of the Lost. Bruce Dern played Bobby Lee. He's Mark Rumsfeld in The Burbs. He's General Sandy Smithers in Hateful Eight. He was Woody Grant in Nebraska. And his daughter, Laura Dern, made her first film appearance this year in Foxes. Anne Margaret, Sue Ann Burnett, uh, long music and acting career, Viva Las Vegas, Bye Bye Birdie, Carnal Knowledge, Tommy, Newsies, Grumpy Old Men. Uh, it's also her birthday today as we're recording yeah, this. Yeah, that's fun. Uh, Graham Jarvis was JD. He was Libby in Misery. He's Howard Humphreys in Mr. Mom. Deborah Wakeham was Nancy. That's the cheerleader. She's Billy's mom in Spider Man. Billy, I think, is a kid who almost gets killed during the Yeah. During the, the, the parade float thing. Yeah, the Green Goblin attack. Janice Bowden in Major League, and she plays a ski patrol person in Out in the Cold. Yeah. The MacGyver episode. <laughs> one of our favorites. Yeah, it's a good one. When when Pete breaks both his legs. Oh my god, I forgot about that. <laughs> the sound of his leg breaking at the end of the episode. <laughs> Woof. That also has a cameo from uh, the most interesting man in the world, Correct, the Dosecki's yeah. guy. Eric Christmas plays Tommy. That's uh, Grandpa. I don't know why he's credited as Tommy because they barely ever say his name. Mm -hmm. uh, he they, plays the. They only say it when they're like talking about how much he hates Mexicans. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's his racist name. 
He plays the priest in Harold and Maude. He co-conducted the seance in The Changeling earlier this year. He's Mr. Carter in Porky's, a senator in The Andromeda Strain. And apparently he died in Camarillo in 2000. Oh, okay. It's another Camarillo death. Uh, Helen Hughes played Ruth. I'm guessing that's the mom. She plays the second grade teacher in Billy Madison. And the she's credited as boardroom lady in Tommy Boy. So I'm assuming that's uh, someone at the company that Aykroyd runs. Jack Mather played the minister here. I don't remember a minister. But he's Ted Old Man Clemens in Billy Madison uh, with Helen Hughes. And uh, he is was... That, is that... He called the shit poop guy? Oh, probably. <laughs> <laughs> it's poop again. <laughs> and uh, he's also the conductor in Silver Streak. I bet that is him. Um, yeah, this is a down... <laughs> well, there is movie. no question that it, it is down all well, of, all of these divorce <laughs> comedies have been awful like all these midlife crisis divorce comedies i i wonder how far into the 80s they carry because i'm already so tired of them um it's a down for me i, yeah. I, I if i was joking earlier when i said well maybe yeah no i get it it's there's no way it was going to be uh, nicely listed there um so overall what are we thinking richard do we know where um, this goes? Yeah, I have this at uh, number eight zero. On my Out of list. ninety, it's eighty. Okay. Um, I have this just below nothing personal. <laughs> I, I do rather, too. I rather watch a movie about clubbing seals, maybe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a romantic <laughs> comedy about clubbing seals. <laughs> than this movie. Yeah. Um, which puts it above Happy Hooker. Okay. <laughs> Jess, what are you thinking? Oi, I think I am putting it. Just above Gorp and just below Home Movies, which which only leaves uh, up the Academy and nothing personal below it. Okay. But man, I hated Gorp so much. Yeah. I really never want to watch that movie again. Uh, and this is ever so slightly more tolerable than that. Um, I'm putting this below nothing personal, but above Bon Voyage Charlie Brown, uh, which means that it is 88th out of 90. So we both have it in 88th out of 90. Um. But yeah, that's where we're this goes for We're all in the 80s. That's what's important. We all recognize yeah. this movie as a very just low. Trash. There's just stuff that doesn't need to happen. The sister character is totally pointless. I also forgot to mention that they're going to the wake and the mom in the back of the car goes, oh, I forgot to tell Becky. Uh, could somebody, and, and then Sue Ann's like, oh, don't worry. Like we talked to her. She's on her way. And it's like, you forgot to tell Becky, your daughter, that yeah. her father died? What Oops. is wrong with you? But the, otherwise, that character is completely unnecessary. Well, in, in, except that she wants to someone to talk to because her pill addiction and cocaine aren't aren't satisfying it. Right. But he doesn't have any personal responsibility to that. Yeah. I, I assume that he hasn't seen her in 10 years either. Yeah. It's not like, like oh, okay, well, I'll, I, suddenly I'm signing up to be my sister's therapist. And it's like, it, no, she's rich. Mm-hmm. Like, she could pay a therapist. She doesn't need her brother to talk her through this shit. Her brother's an idiot. But also out of the whole three problems that this now makes in his yeah. life, this one is totally valid to be like, look, I'm I'm going through some stuff right now. I don't think I can help you. Yeah. And he could say that to his mom too, conceivably. They have money. Like, it's not like they're hurting for money. They have money. He could just be like, here, I'm I'm giving you money to go get a place. He you has know. his whole house wired above his bed. Yeah. That kind of electrical work isn't cheap. <laughs> Yeah, he, they've they made it very clear that he's rich. So he's not hurting for money. His mom doesn't care that she's being asked to move out. She sounds excited about the new condo that she found. Hey, she's so, not living in an RV. She's yeah. happy. So that, that problem isn't even a real problem. So really, his only complaint is that he has to be married and go to work. And have sex. Right. What a fucking asshole well and talk to his son that's all the son even wanted too. yeah all the son was just like just, just hear me, me out <laughs> not do anything not solve my problems just talk to me yeah but everyone wants him to be the daddy like my son wants me to be the daddy and uh nobody else but everyone wants me to be the daddy it's so frustrating to have to father the things that squirt out of you <laughs> <laughs> anyway uh patrick is working through some other problems <laughs> yeah kids keep falling out of me um yeah no that's um i think that's about it for this one that sound fair yeah i i got nothing that's more than it 
If you guys have any thoughts you'd like to share on this one, I will be surprised. <laughs> we are Vintage Video Pod on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Letterboxd, where, as I said before, you can find each of our full movie rankings for the year. We can also be found at VintageVideoPodcast.com. Please consider rating us on iTunes to help people find the show, and if you take the time to leave us a review, we will thank you personally in an upcoming episode. If you're feeling especially generous, you can also support the show through Patreon.com slash VintageVideoPodcast. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time when we'll be discussing The Final Countdown which IMDb describes like so. A modern aircraft carrier is thrown back in time to 1941 near Hawaii just hours before the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. We leave you now with the trailer for the final countdown. On December the 6th, 1980, the nuclear-powered attack aircraft carrier USS Nimitz, with a crew of 5,000 men and a strike force of 90 aircraft, was on a routine mission in the Pacific when it encountered a storm unlike any ever recorded, and disappeared. Antennas check out, but we're off the air. Any word from our destroyers? We aren't getting anything except some code transmissions in the 200 meter band. Otherwise, we're dead as a doornail. Op, what's our radar picture? Radar shows us clear, sir. Can't you see that Russian trawler? I have the signal officer on deck, but no visual sighting, sir. All of us know that movement through time is possible. Einstein proved it. There are forces in the universe which we're only now just beginning to understand. I mean understand through science, not superstition. There are black holes in space, antimatter, curved space. Things that are as strange to us as electricity would have been to people in the Middle Ages. Or this ship in World War II. Help! Help! What's happening here? Who are you people? Are we at war? Is that what happened? Splash the zeros. I say again, splash the zeros. We've got an incredible opportunity here. We know where all the mistakes are going to be made for the next 40 years, and you've got the power to correct them. I've got planes out there. Those planes give us all a second chance. We're a bunch of damn fools if we don't take it. Those men have enough knowledge among them to build the atom bomb, reach the moon years before it should have happened. Is that a terrifying prospect, Captain? On December the 6th, 1980, the nuclear carrier USS Nimitz disappeared in the Pacific and reappeared December 6th, 1941, off the coast of Pearl Harbor. The final countdown is about to begin.